Lecture number two, the four noble truths. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. With this talk, we turn from the Buddha to his teaching. The Buddha's teaching is called the Dhamma. The word Dhamma comes from the Pali root Dara, which means to support, to sustain, to hold up. The word Dhamma has several shades of meaning. In its most basic sense, the word Dhamma signifies the true nature of things. The Dhamma is the fundamental element of lawfulness operating in the universe, structuring all events, all experience, all phenomena. And all actual things, all phenomena, are called Dhammas in the plural because all of them embody, incorporate the true nature of things. The word Dhamma also means the ethical law, the fundamental principle of righteousness, the cosmic law of virtue and goodness. Dhamma also has a practical sense, something applicable to our own life. Dhamma is that which sustains us, which supports us, which upholds our own efforts to live in virtue and goodness. In this sense, Dhamma is the path On one hand, it's the lower path of ethical virtue, which harmonizes with the cosmic moral law. Then also Dhamma is the supramundane path, the higher path, that leads to the realization of the true nature of things, that brings the attainment of truth. The word Dhamma also applies to the Buddha's teaching. The Buddha's teaching is called the Dhamma Because this teaching makes known clearly, explicitly, perfectly the true self-subsistent Dhamma, the true nature of things. Now, in approaching the Dhamma, it is necessary to come to it with the right attitude, with the right frame of mind, with the right understanding and right intention. By way of understanding the Dhamma, We should not take it to be a formulated creed, something that demands to be accepted on faith. Also, the Dhamma shouldn't be taken to be just a system of ideas, a set of doctrines, something to be played about with intellectually. The Dhamma, as we said, is essentially a path, a way that leads to the realization of truth. And Dhamma is also the truth that is to be realized realized in immediate experience. The Buddha's teaching as the Dhamma, as the formulation of Dhamma, involves a number of doctrines and principles. But these are presented to us not as fixed articles of belief, but as pointers, aids to awaken our own understanding, to bring about an opening of our own eyes of wisdom. The various doctrines presented in the Dhamma come out of the Buddha's own experience of enlightenment, not out of speculation, not out of belief, but out of his own realization of truth. And these same doctrines are presented to us with the aim of leading us to the attainment of enlightenment so that we can share the Buddha's own insight into the true nature of experience. The Dhamma is called Opanayaka. It leads onward, step by step, to a deepening realization of truth. It's called Niyanika, emancipating, leading to liberation. And where this realization of Dhamma is to take place is within ourself, in our own experience. The Dhamma is the true nature of things the truth that's written into our own experience. And this truth has to be seen within our own experience, the same way, with the same immediacy that we can see an object held in the hand. And to realize this truth, we have to travel the path, the path of Dhamma, all by ourselves. There's nobody else that can walk it for us. We've got to walk the path by ourselves. 
But the formulated Dhamma, the Dhamma taught by the Buddha, guides us in our effort to walk the path. It enables us to see, it points out what has to be understood. It doesn't present us with any neat system of ideas to be admired and discussed. It doesn't let us off with easy answers to the ultimate question. What it gives us is basically the method the way to find the answers for ourselves, the way to make our own discovery of truth. The Dharma focuses upon the lived immediacy of human life, upon our own life. It doesn't start off with any kind of theoretical postulate, any dogmas, any creeds to be believed. It begins with an observation A simple observation, but one very profound, the gateway to all wisdom. This is the observation that human life is essentially problematic, that is beset with problems, difficulties, inadequacies, what the Buddha calls dukkha, usually translated as suffering. And the value of the Dhamma is pragmatic and instrumental. It offers to show us the way out of our problematic situation, the way to attain inner freedom, to realize the highest and truest happiness. And the Buddha presents the Dhamma as the means to this goal, the method. And he compares the Dhamma to a raft. We use a raft to get from one side of a river to the other, not to worship, not to enshrine, not to put on our head and to carry around with us wherever we go. In the same way, we use the Dhamma as our means, the way to get from our present state of bondage and suffering, of dukkha, to get across to the other shore, the state of absolute freedom, Nibbana, the end of suffering. Because of this practical bent, The Buddha dismisses all purely speculative concerns as irrelevant. He says that he teaches only suffering and the cessation of suffering. And all other pursuits, all other philosophical pursuits, he says, are futile, misleading, even dangerous. And the Buddha compares the metaphysician obsessed with his speculations to a man struck by a poisoned arrow. A man is lying, he's been hit by a poisoned arrow, a physician comes to him, offers to remove the arrow, and the man says, no, I won't let you take out the arrow until you tell me the name of the man who shot me, what class he comes from, what his family is, what kind of material he made the arrow from, what kind of poison he used, what kind of bow he used. Such a man will die before he recovers. In the same way, the Buddha says, the speculative thinker, lost in his questions and his systems of thought, only continues to wallow in suffering without finding the way to liberation. And the Buddha's teaching is presented solely and entirely to give us the way to liberation. Now, the recorded teachings of the Buddha are very numerous But all of these diverse teachings fit together into a single unifying frame which is completely consistent, completely coherent. This frame is the teaching of the Four Noble Truths. And the Buddha compares the Four Noble Truths to the footprint of an elephant. And just as the footprint of the elephant can contain the footprints of all the other animals, the footprints of tigers, lions, dogs, cats, bears, deer, all fit into the footprint of the elephant. So all the different teachings taught by the Buddha fit into this single framework of the Four Noble Truths. This is the key which unifies all the different teachings of the Buddha. It's sometimes believed that the Four Noble Truths form an introductory teaching 
the ABCs of Buddhism, preparations for the higher doctrines, for the real deep esoteric stuff. This view, however, is not correct. In the suttas, the Buddha makes it clear that the realization of the Four Noble Truths coincides with the attainment of enlightenment itself. In his first discourse spoken to his first five disciples, when he sets in motion the wheel of Dhamma, the Buddha says that as long as I did not fully understand and penetrate the Four Noble Truths, I didn't claim in this world that I had reached the Supreme Enlightenment. But when I fully penetrated the Four Noble Truths, then I could claim that I reached the Supreme Enlightenment. And the teaching of the Four Noble Truths was the special mission of the Buddha. It's called the Samukhangsika Dhamma Desana, the unique Dhamma teaching of an enlightened one. And the Buddha says that just as when the sun and moon haven't appeared in the world, then there's no shining forth of light, no radiance, but only darkness covers the world. And there's no discrimination of the day and night, of the seasons and the years. In the same way, he says, as long as a Buddha doesn't appear in the world, then there's no teaching, no exposition of the Four Noble Truths but only spiritual blindness and darkness prevail. But when a Buddha arises in the world, that is like the arising of the sun and the moon, shedding great light over the world. When the Buddha appears, then there's a teaching of the Four Noble Truths, the explanation and analysis and exposition of the Four Noble Truths. So the special purpose of the whole Dhamma is to make known the Four Noble Truths. And the special aim of those treading the path to enlightenment is to see for themselves the Four Noble Truths. The Buddha says that as long as we remain blind to the Four Noble Truths, we are lost in ignorance. We roam in samsara, the ocean of birth and death, the round of suffering. But when we awaken to the truth, when we make them a living experience, that is the wisdom of enlightenment. That leads to Nibbana, to the freedom of the liberated mind. Now, before we can realize the Four Noble Truths, we have to understand them. And to understand them, we have to learn what they are. The first Noble Truth is the truth of Dukkha. The term dukkha is usually translated as suffering, but as we'll see, the Pali word has a much deeper meaning than this word. The second truth is the truth of the origin of dukkha, the cause of suffering. And this the Buddha identifies as craving or thirst, the blind, self-centered desire. The third noble truth is the truth of the cessation of, of dukkha, the end of suffering which the Buddha identifies as Nirvana, the deathless state. And the fourth noble truth is the truth of the path, the way to liberation from dukkha. That is the noble eightfold path. And from this explanation, we can see that the four noble truths actually center around a single theme, a single subject. That is what's called dukkha. And they differ simply in that they treat this theme from four different angles. The first truth lays out the problem, the forms of dukkha. The second truth traces the problem to its cause. The third truth gives us the solution. And the fourth truth maps out the means to achieve the solution. Now, since the whole concern of the Four Noble Truths as with the problem is with the problem of dukkha. Our understanding of the duk of the Dhamma hinges upon the way we understand this word. Now the word dukkha has often been translated as suffering, pain, and misery. And while these capture part of its meaning, they also give rise to misconceptions. Part of the problem is the fact that there's no single English word 
that really does justice to the original Pali word. The Pali word dukkha originally meant pain and suffering, and the Buddha sometimes uses it in this limited sense when he speaks about unpleasant feelings of body and of mind and calls them dukkha vedana, painful feelings. But the Buddha took this word of common usage and he raised it to a higher level, a philosophical level, where it expresses a deep and comprehensive vision of human existence. And from this perspective, this higher angle, the word dukkha comes to suggest a basic unsatisfactoriness pervading all existence, all forms of life, due to the fact that all forms of life are changing, impermanent, unstable, without any inner core or substance. The term dukkha thus indicates a lack of perfection in experience, a perpetual gap in unbalance between an ideal state we desire and hope for and envisage and the real state of our existence that we have to put up with, a condition that never really measures up to our standards and expectations. These are the ideas that are suggested by the word dukkha, and these ideas have to be taken into account if we are to understand the Four Noble Truths correctly. Sometimes when we explain the Buddha's teaching, we'll continue to use the common translation suffering, just because this word communicates rather more directly than the Pali word. Other times we'll stick to the Pali. But when we use the English word suffering, we should understand it generally in the deeper, more broader sense given to it by the Buddha, rather than in the limited sense as felt pain or unhappiness. Now something has to be said about each of the words in the phrase Four Noble Truths. Each of these words is significant. First, what is implied by the word such a truth? The Pali word such a has a different nuance than the English word truth. The English word truth usually means a statement or proposition corresponding to a real state of affairs. Truth is here a verbal formulation or a mental representation of a state of affairs. The Pali word satcha means that which is. It indicates an existing reality rather than a true statement or proposition. Thus, the four noble truths are not four propositions, but four actualities, four realities. The first truth is the state of dukkha itself. The second truth is its actual cause, craving. The third truth is its cessation, nibbana. And the fourth truth is the path, the noble eightfold path. The fact that these are truths implies that they are not merely formulations propounded by the Buddha. The four truths are four actualities discovered by the Buddha, found by him, seen by him, quite independent of him. In his first discourse, the Buddha says that on the night of his enlightenment, with respect to the Four Noble Truths, the I arose, the vision arose, knowledge arose, understanding arose. He gained insight into the truth. He saw them. He penetrated them. This means he didn't create them. When I see, for example, this lamp in front of me, my sight doesn't create the lamp. With my eyes, I just see what is already there. In the same way, the Buddha's enlightenment was a discovery of the Four Noble Truths, not a creation of them. And likewise, in following the path, what we aim to do is to awaken to truth, to the Four Truths, to open our inner eye, the eye of wisdom, so that we can see for ourselves the fundamental realities of human life the truths which are always present but just hidden from our sight due to the screen of ignorance. Now the truths are called Arya Satcha, noble truths. And they gain the name noble truths for several reasons. We can mention three. The first 
is that they are the truth taught by the Aryans, the noble ones, that is, by the Buddha. That's the simplest reason. The second reason is that they are the truths that lead to the Aryan state. An Aryan is a noble one. And these are the truths that can transform a person into an Aryan, into a noble one. In Buddhist doctrine, all human beings are divided into two general classes. On the one hand, there are the Putujinas, the ordinary people, the unenlightened people. Even if somebody might be quite extraordinary, but if he still lacks the eye of enlightenment, he's a Putujina, an average man, a worldling. On the other hand, there are the Aryans, the noble ones those who are either fully enlightened or are in the process of awakening or are definitely on the path to enlightenment. Now, what distinguishes the ordinary people from the Aryans, from the noble ones, is just the realization of these four noble truths. Those who realize them, as soon as they see them, become inwardly transformed. They undergo a spiritual rebirth and become a new kind of man. They leave the ranks of the worldlings, the Putujinas. They enter the ranks of the noble ones, the Aryans. They become bound for enlightenment, incapable of turning back. Then the third reason the truths are called Aryan truths, the noble truths, is because they call for noble qualities. They call for the courage the honesty, the wisdom, the profundity of character, to see reality as it is. The truths are just so, not otherwise, real and immutable. Tatta, avitatta, ananyata. Such as they are, not otherwise, immutable. And those who have the qualities to recognize these truths, these are the true Aryans. Then there are four truths, exactly four truths. And there are exactly four truths because, because the four together are needed to constitute, to constitute a definite logical unity, tied together by the tightest bond. The logic spells out the problem, its source, its solution, and the means to its solution. None of these truths can be removed without destroying the very possibility of liberation. And no other truth has to be added to them. The, poor, the four are perfectly sufficient in themselves. And they give us everything that we need to gain liberation. The logic of the four truths is exactly the same as the formula a doctor uses to deal with the patient. When the patient comes to a doctor with a certain sickness, the doctor starts off with a diagnosis. That is, he examines the patient, he takes note of his symptoms, and he tries to determine what is the disease the patient is suffering from. This is like the first noble truth. Here the Buddha sets out the basic affliction of human life, the problem of dukkha, suffering. Then after he makes his diagnosis, the doctor lays down an etiology. He sets out the cause of the disease. This is analogous to the second noble truth. Here the Buddha tracks down the cause of dukkha. He finds it in craving. As a third step, the doctor gives a prognosis. He determines the possibility of a cure, what must be done to remove the disease. This is like the third truth, the cessation of dukkha. Here the Buddha announces, yes, suffering can be ended. Then, as a fourth step, the doctor gives a remedy. He prescribes a course of treatment that can remove the disease. This is just what the Buddha does in the fourth noble truth. He prescribes the noble eightfold path. This is the medicine for curing the disease of suffering. Now, we will deal with each of the four noble truths individually, examining each in detail. And we start with the first noble truth the Dukkangarya Satchang, usually translated the noble truth of suffering. 
And in the suttas, the Buddha explains this first noble truth simply by listing the different forms of dukkha. Here, I'd like to read just from the text from the usual sutta. He says, What is the noble truth of suffering? Of dukkha. Birth is suffering. Old age, aging is suffering. Disease is suffering. Death is suffering. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair are suffering. To be separated from the pleasant is suffering. To be united with the unpleasant is suffering. Not to get what one wants is suffering. In brief, the five aggregates of clinging are suffering. So here we have different forms of dukkha. First, birth. Birth technically means the moment of conception, the moment of springing up in the womb. In a more general sense, it means the entire process of gestation, from the moment of conception up to the time of the exit from the womb. And here, birth in itself, when it takes place, it becomes a painful experience being thrust out from the womb, thrown out into the world without any choice, without any understanding. This can be a very dramatic experience. In fact, they speak of the birth trauma. And birth is dukkha also, since this is the foundation, the first point for all the other forms of dukkha that will follow in the course of lifetime, of the lifetime. Then after birth, then growth takes place. Growth, development, this isn't mentioned specifically as a form of dukkha, though of course this also involves its share of pain and suffering. Then when the maximum point of growth is reached, then aging sets in. The hair turns gray, the skin wrinkles, the teeth begin to fall out. The sense faculties lose their sharpness. The mind loses its intelligence, memory grows dimmer, strength and vitality decline. That's the suffering of old age. Then sickness has various forms, ailments of the body, disease, accidents, injuries, and so on. Ailments of the mind, worry, anxiety, neuroses, psychoses. Then at the end comes death, the breakup of the body, the extinguishing of the life force. Death also a form of suffering. These four items, birth, old age, sickness, and death, these can be called occasional dukkha, since they come only at certain times. Then the Buddha mentions five terms which give a kind of overview of the vocabulary of suffering. Sokapari Deva Dukkha Domina Supayasa. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. Sorrow is intense woe because of some deprivation of some kind. Lamentation, that's crying and weeping. Pain is bodily pain. Grief is any kind of mental unhappiness. Then despair, that's the very lowest point of mental anguish where all hope is given up. Then the Buddha says, he says, union with the unpleasant is dukkha. That is, there are various unpleasant situations we don't want to face, disagreeable people we don't want to associate with, disagreeable things we don't want to meet with. We have to face these situations, people and things. We're thrown into contact with them against our will. And as a result, we meet with suffering. Then there's separation from the pleasant. There are pleasant and agreeable situ situations we would like to meet with, we hope will last. Pleasant people we want to make contact with, to hold to, to cling to, relationships we want to endure. But events follow their own law. They don't conform to our will. And eventually we have to face separation from everyone and everything we cherish. From parents, friends, brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, and children. 
It takes place separation and as a result suffering. Then the Buddha says not to get what we desire. That is dukkha, that is suffering. Generally we desire pleasure, wealth, fame and praise but instead we meet often with pain, with poverty, with dishonor and blame. As a result of this there comes suffering. We want to remain young for we have to grow old. We want to be healthy for we fall sick. We would like to live forever but we have to die. Thus even those types of physical suffering can become types of suffering, not getting what one wants. These three, the union with the unpleasant, separation from the pleasant, and not getting what we want, these can be called frequent dukkha because we meet them quite often in the course of life. Then the Buddha sums up the whole first noble truth. He says, in brief, the five aggregates of clinging are dukkha. With this statement, the Buddha indicates that all our experience is included in dukkha. And thus, this aspect can be called constant dukkha, continual dukkha. Now we have to understand what are meant by the five aggregates of clinging. The five aggregates are the basic components of our experience, the basic elements of our existence. We exist as psychophysical organisms, and this organism can be broken down into five types of factors. On the one hand, there is the material form, that covers the body, the material body with its sense faculties. That is the physical, the material side of our organism. Then the other four aggregates, those cover the mental side. That's the analysis of mind. The mind is analyzed into four groups of factors. That is feeling, vedana, the factor by which we feel pleasure, pain, or indifference. Perception, the third aggregate is perception, the factor by which we take note of the properties of objects. The fourth aggregate is the aggregate of mental formation, that is all the mental acts of volition, of will, the different desires, the emotional states, the habitual tendencies of the mind. Then the fifth aggregate is the aggregate of consciousness, the jnana, the basic awareness of an object. So we have the psychophysical organism made up of these five aggregates, material form or the body and the mind, which is made up of feelings, perceptions, the mental formations and consciousness. And the reason these are all included in dukkha is that they are all impermanent, changing from moment to moment. In fact, they are only events, momentary events without any inner core, without any substance underlying, underlying them, lasting through time. What we call myself, my being, is just a combination, a compound of these five insubstantial aggregates changing from moment to moment. And because our being is always changing without any solid substance inside of it, there is nothing we can hold to in our personalities, in our being, as a basis for lasting happiness. Even though we seek security in the five aggregates by clinging to them, by identifying with them, by taking them to be mine, what I truly am myself, we can never find that security. For the five aggregates are just a process, the becoming. And this becoming of the aggregates, this goes on from life to life, continuously. As long as it goes on from life to life, we continue to meet the different forms of suffering. Thus, the aggregates are the basis for all dukkha, for all suffering. 
It is they that are born, the aggregate that are born, the aggregates grow old, the aggregates fall sick. The aggregates meet pain and sorrow and eventually die. So the five aggregates of clinging are dukkha. Then to make it clear that dukkha means more than ordinary suffering, that it has this extended sense, the Buddha explains sometimes that there are three levels of dukkha. The first and most elementary level is ordinary suffering. This is called dukkha dukkata. Dukkha as ordinary suffering. This signifies experienced suffering. And this experienced suffering can be either bodily or mental. Bodily pain stands out most clearly in the cases of accident, injury, sickness, in violent contacts with the body. Then there's mental suffering, mental pain. This has a great range from momentary feelings of irritation and annoyance down through deeper experiences of disappointment, of sorrow, grief, frustration, down to the very deepest experiences of anguish, dejection, and despair. All of these are included as forms of mental suffering. So bodily pain and mental pain, these make up dukkha dukkata. Dukkha in the sense of actual felt suffering. But then we come to the second level of dukkha. And this takes us a step further, a step more removed from felt suffering. This is called dukkha due to change, viparinama dukkata. At this level, we see that all our pleasant experience is really a form of dukkha. The reason is that all pleasant experiences are subject to change. The objects that give us pleasure are impermanent. They don't last. And therefore, the pleasure that we get from them is also impermanent. It has to pass away. So when the objects of attachment pass away, because we cling to them and become attached to them, then the result for ourselves is pain and suffering. But this aspect of dukkha, dukkha due to change, this has to be properly understood. It doesn't mean, as we might think it means, simply that suffering arises through the change of our pleasure. Rather, it means that the pleasant experiences themselves and the things that give pleasure are already dukkha, even while we're enjoying them. And the reason for this is that they're bound to pass away. And because they're going to pass away, even in the immediacy of enjoyment, they're dukkha. Youth has to give way to old age, And therefore, even while we are young, our youth, youthfulness, is still dukkha. Health can be undermined by disease, and therefore, even when we are healthy, that state of health is dukkha. And life has to end in death, and therefore, life itself becomes dukkha. The third level of dukkha, this takes us to the deepest implications of the truth of suffering, the first noble truth. This is called Sankara Dukkata, the Dukkha of Condition Formation. The word Sankara here means Condition Formation. This is the aspect of Dukkha the, the Buddha points at when he says the five aggregates of clinging are Dukkha. The Condition Formations are the five aggregates. And these five aggregates, as we just explained, are the elements of our being, of our person. What we identify ourselves with, our individually, is simply a combination of conditioned phenomena, mental and material processes undergoing constant transformation. And these five aggregates function by themselves We don't have mastery over them. We don't have absolute control over them. We can't govern them according to our will. 
They go their own way. They're unstable, impermanent, subject to rise and fall. And because they're in this constant process of rising and falling, for one with deep wisdom, they're experienced as dukkha, unsatisfactory. That is the profound meaning of of sankhara dukkha, the unsatisfactoriness of conditioned formation. Now, the teaching given by the Buddha in the First Noble Truth often tends to arouse a certain degree of emotional resistance. This gives rise to misunderstandings, sometimes to false charges. The Buddha is a pessimist, a negativist, one who sees only the dark side of things. However, we have to understand the Buddha's purpose and intention in teaching the First Noble Truth. The Buddha's aim and his whole Dhamma is to lead us to liberation, to lead us out of an unsatisfactory situation. And the way to liberation lies through correct knowledge, through seeing and understanding our existence as it is. In coming to the Dhamma, we have to come with an open mind, ready to look at things objectively, to see them as they are, yatha bhutang jnana knowing and seeing things as they are. And this calls for some effort, and sometimes it involves some amount of internal friction. Our usual way of seeing things, of interpreting our existence, is largely determined by our desires. We tend to notice things, to conceive and interpret our experience in ways that are dictated by our desires, in ways that confirm our preconcept, that confirm our preconceptions. And thus we blot out things we don't want to see. And we take note of the appearances of those things we want to see. On a larger scale, we put the old people off into homes for the aged. We don't want to see old age. The sick people are put off into hospitals. And if we have to go to the hospital, we go reluctantly. The dead are embalmed and covered over with nice flowers and put into (laughs) very nice tombs. Poverty and war we shut off into little corners of our mind. We sit comfortably, looking at nice, pleasant, cozy, comfortable things. We're driven, basically, by an innate desire for pleasure, and by a love of life. And so any teaching that tends to call these urges into question arouses some degree of inner opposition. The mind makes use of its intelligence and clever ways, uses ploys to justify its attachment, its clinging to its pleasures, to justify its own neat little picture of the world. And so we set up thick emotional screens around our mental eyes. And so we set up thick emotional screens around our mental eyes. So we see and conceive and understand things in ways that are governed by our desires, in ways that turn back and reinforce our desires, that validate them, give them the seal of approval, and let them go scot-free. But the approach required in understanding the Dhamma is quite different. The Buddha says that the Dhamma is patisota gamini, that it goes against the stream of our ordinary inclination. But the Dhamma is the truth of our existence, the real nature of things. And to understand the truth of our existence, we have to be prepared to look at existence as it is. The Buddha doesn't aim at making us gloomy pessimists, quite the contrary. But he also isn't going out to to console us with false comfort. The Buddha's aim is to awaken us, to make us seers of truth, seers of that which is. For it is only seeing, 
seeing rightly that leads to freedom. And to become seers of that which is, we have to stop seeing what we want to see. We have to undergo a kind of process of unlearning to remove the screen of prejudices and pre-established views. It requires an ability to sit down, to take a good, long look at our existence in order to understand it correctly, free from all preconceptions as to how we want it to appear. And the Buddha holds that to gain a complete view of our existence, we have to look at it from three angles, to see it in terms of three aspects it presents. One is the aspect of a sadha, which means enjoyment or satisfaction. The second is the aspect of a dinava, danger or unsatisfactoriness. The third is the aspect of nisarana, release or escape. In viewing our lives from these three angles, the Buddha points out firstly that life involves a sadha. It involves pleasure and enjoyment. He says that if there was no enjoyment in the world, in our belongings, in our achievements, in activities, in personal relationships, and so on, people wouldn't become attached to the world. But it's precisely because there is enjoyment in the world that people become attached to it. And not all of these enjoyments are wrong or unwholesome. The Buddha never says this. Many can be worthy and many deeply rewarding. The happiness of a good family life, of friendship, of true love, of aesthetic pleasures, of religious life. But the Buddha points out that existence also has to be looked at from another angle. This is the angle of a dean of us, the unsatisfactoriness, the inadequacy. And this inadequacy consists in the fact that all our experience, including our pleasures and joys, is impermanent. Everything is subject to change, and in many ways, at a deep level, it can be connected with pain and with dissatisfaction. Then the third angle the Buddha indicates is the aspect of relief, the sarana. To be free from suffering, we have to put away the attachment and desire for the objects of enjoyment. Since it is this attachment that leads us into the pain and suffering. But still the question might be asked, if life involves both enjoyment and disappointment, both happiness and suffering, why does the Buddha put so much stress on the negative side? Why is he so much concerned with showing up the aspect of dukkha rather than acknowledging both pleasure and suffering equally? To understand why the Buddha makes the problem of dukkha the theme of his teaching, we have to understand the intention behind his formulation of the doctrine. The Buddha's thought really begins not with the truth of dukkha, but with something more fundamental. This fundamental starting point is the fact that all living beings seek happiness. The most basic and universal urge of all life is the urge for happiness. But when we inquire into the nature of the happiness we seek, we find that it is a state free from suffering, an experience that's associated with suffering, that's tied up in some way with pain, sorrow, worry, or dislike, can be pleasurable, enjoyable, but it can serve as a base for true happiness. And therefore, we make a distinction between true happiness and seeming happiness, the illusion of happiness. True happiness is a state which is immune to suffering, a state that cannot be touched or corrupted by dukkha. And to find such a state, we have to take the things we ordinarily consider to be sources of happiness and find out if they are really so they really can give us the happiness we want. A perfectly complete satisfaction free from any mixture with suffering. 
And if they cannot do so, if they should turn out to be connected with suffering or to lead into suffering, then we have to draw the conclusion that they're really dukkha, concealed forms of dukkha. Now, if we reflect carefully, we'll see that a great part of our common experiences of pleasure and enjoyment is bound up in some way with pain. It involves a subtle kind of dissatisfaction. This might not be evident at once, but it becomes clear when we reflect carefully. We use what the Buddha calls yoniso manasikara, wise consideration. Let's take the things we ordinarily turn to for happiness. What are these? Sense pleasures? The beauty and health of the body? feelings of aesthetic enjoyment, interpersonal relations, most generally life itself. The Buddha examines all of these sources of happiness in different places in the suttas, and he shows how they're all defective, how they fail to measure up to the criterion we set for true happiness. First take sense pleasures. Sense pleasures give some amount of happiness, but they are bound up with excitement and with agitation. When we enjoy them, we tend to grasp them, to clutch them, to try to draw from them whatever enjoyment they can give. And our enjoyment might be accompanied by anxiety and worry. We're afraid that the objects of pleasure will perish, be stolen, or lose their flavor. But the people who give us pleasure will leave us. Our enjoyment might be mixed with guilt when we enjoy them at the expense of someone else. The enjoyment leads to greater attachment. We cling even more tightly to the sources, to the sense enjoyment. We become more and more de- dependent on them. Develop kind of addiction to them. Then when the pleasurable objects or persons are lost, we feel sorrow and grief. And often we find that the pleasures that we've sought for, when we get them, they don't give us the happiness, all the happiness that we expected of them. Even when we get them, even when we're satiated with them, they still leave us feeling hollow, unfulfilled, discontent. Then we cling to the body when it's beautiful and healthy. We become proud of it and happy with it. But as time goes by, the body loses it, loses its beauty, its health. It grows old, it can fall sick, it becomes ugly. Then there comes sorrow. Aesthetic feelings, religious experiences, even meditative experiences, might give some kind of serene and detached happiness, but that's not permanent. Personal relationships, these can be deeply fulfilling. But again, they're not stable. Sometimes the personal feelings change. Sometimes friction breaks out, misunderstanding. Then this will be followed by parting and separation. And even when the relationships are fruitful and lasting, they still can't last forever. In the end, we have to be separated from everyone we love. Death comes and breaks the connection. Then life itself, this is taken to be the ultimate good, the source of all our happiness. But let's take a close look at life, at our existence. And to reach a valid evaluation of existence, we have to go beyond our own standpoint. We have to look at life in general, sentient existence in general. We have to widen our mental horizons, to stretch our consciousness outward to cover all life, to see what is the degree, the amount of experience, pain and suffering in life. From our own position of relative prosperity and security, the fact of suffering might not be very, um, very serious. It might seem remote, something maybe that we meet with only occasionally. But if we open our mental eyes, if we extend our sense of identity to all that live, you'll see that the suffering in the world is really very vast, very pervasive, sometimes very terrible. We have to think of the millions of people without enough food to eat, 
children going hungry, starving, undernourished. People without clothing and shelter, refugees and orphans. People afflicted with various diseases, lying in hospitals without adequate medical care, without hope of recovery. We have to think of the old people, lonely, neglected, despondent, dying too slowly. We have to think also of the people who might be healthy and well-nourished, but they're living in totalitarian countries with tyrannical governments, living filled with fear and distrust, unable to think freely and to express their thoughts freely. Also, we have to think of those who are caught in the net of violence and the destruction of war. Think of those, the victims of accidents, earthquakes, fires, floods. Think also of those who are well-off and successful and prosperous, living in free countries, but their lives are unfulfilled. They have no sense of purpose. To use Thoreau's words, people who are living lives of quiet desperation. Then we have to think more widely even than the human world. Think of the animals as well. Wild animals living in a constant struggle for survival. The only rule is to devour or to be devoured, to kill or to be killed. You have to think also of the domestic animals living in their dullness, forced to work, driven by men to work, raised to be slaughtered and eaten. And then for all life, the ultimate end, as the Buddha's always already indicated, is old age, illness, and death. So that's the evaluation of life itself. From these reflections, we can see the things that we turn to for happiness do give us pleasure. They give a temporary gratification. But what they don't give us is a deep, lasting, complete sense of gratification. None is absolutely reliable. They change, they break up, they prove disappointing, they issue in more clinging. At their core, they're inadequate, unsatisfactory. And thus, they turn out to be really forms of dukkha. Now, it might be claimed that even though life has its share of suffering and disappointment, still it offers its opportunities for pleasure. Now, we should grasp these as long as we have the chance. Even though things are impermanent, they have to change, still we can try to grasp as much enjoyment as we can. Just when one enjoyment goes, let go of it and choose another. That would be the philosophy of gather your rosebuds while you may. That might be a true principle if this were the only life that we live. But the Buddha teaches that this is not the only life. And to really get a complete picture of the full range of dukkha, to see dukkha in its fullest measure, we have to take account of one additional fact, one fact which will multiply the range of dukkha to infinity, and this is the fact of rebirth. The Buddha teaches that we do not live one time only, but many times, countless times. Our life is part of a succession of rebirth a process of repeated existence that's been going on since beginningless time. This is samsara, the wheel of rebirth, the wheel of birth and death. One life succeeds another without any first point. Birth, growth, decay, and death, followed by more birth, growth, decay, and death. That is the pattern that's been repeating itself over and over, countless times without beginning. And the consequences of this teaching on samsara, the round of rebirth, consequences are very important. The Buddha himself makes the point in a group of suttas in the Sangyutta Nikaya called the Anamataga Sangyutta, the collected saying from the beginningless samsara. He says that countless times in our wandering through the round of birth and death we've experienced 
the deaths of our parents, the deaths of brothers, of sisters, children and friends. Countless times we've met sorrow and grief, separated from the pleasant, united with the painful. We've wept and lamented and we've shed more tears than there's water in the great ocean. Life after life, crying and weeping, we shed more tears than the water in the ocean. And as long as we go on, we're likely to meet the same forms of suffering over and over in the future. And we meet suffering in all the different planes of existence. In the course of our wandering through birth and death, we've inhabited all the different planes. The heavens, the lower world, the human realm, the animal realm. And many times we've experienced the dukkha of those planes. And our future is uncertain. Just the turn of the wheel, the transition from death to birth, separates us from rebirth into lands torn by poverty, by oppression, by war from rebirth into the lower world. And even life in the heaven is no con- in the heavens is no consolation. For life in all the planes of existence comes to an end. And so when heavenly life comes to an end, we'll be followed by a rebirth someplace else. We don't know where. So when we examine our lives in the light of the Buddha's teaching, it becomes clear that real happiness, true lasting happiness, cannot be found in the realm of the conditions, in the realm of the world of birth and death. All conditioned things are transient. To find real happiness becomes necessary to turn away from all that is conditioned, from all that's subject to aging, to decay and death. But as we said before, the Buddha's teaching recognizes our most fundamental urge be the urge for happiness. And the teaching is a doctrine of deliverance is intended to bring the fulfillment of that urge. But the Buddha teaches that real happiness, stable and perishable happiness, is to be found only in the unconditioned, that is, in the bana, the deathless state. And that is the real import of the first noble truth, that to reach the state of perfect peace of happiness free from suffering we have to turn away from the conditioned formation the five aggregates and to seek the unconditioned vipana but to get free from the conditioned we have to find the causes for our bondage if we're tied up and not tied up by bonds we have to find how the bonds are tied what are the knots in order to undo the knots So this brings us to the second noble truth. The second noble truth is the truth of the origin of dukkha. Dukkha samudaya arya satya. And this truth aims at showing us the cause of suffering, the real cause of dukkha. Now different philosophies and religions give us different answers to the question as to why we're subject to suffering. Some say that suffering occurs through chance or through purely naturalistic causes. Some say that it comes by fate or destiny. Still others attribute it to the will of an almighty God to inflict suffering on us as punishment for some original sin or as a means to purify us and make us worthy of his love. All these explanations the Buddha dismisses as fanciful, products of belief and imagination. They all (coughs) lead to one of two results. Either they encourage a passive acceptance of suffering, resignation, or else they get us involved in treating the symptoms. We see the first in the fatalists and in certain forms of theism. We see the second in the attempt of modern secularists to make our lives cozy and comfortable by all sorts of technological wonders. But the Buddha's approach to the problem of dukkha is quite different. The Buddha's approach is to trace the problem to its cause, to its root. It is said in the text that the Buddha is like a lion and the other philosophers are like a dog. 
If somebody throws a stone at a dog, the dog chases the stone. This is like the thinker who tries to stop dukkha by treating the symptom. But if somebody throws a stone at a lion, the lion chases the person who threw it. That is like the Buddha, who tackles the problem of suffering by attacking the cause. And to deal with the cause is very essential. We can only eliminate dukkha by getting rid of the cause, by eradicating the cause. If we deal only with the symptoms, with the forms of dukkha, and leave the cause intact, then beneath the surface, beneath our comforts and pleasures, the volcano of suffering will continue to gather forth, and in time it's bound to erupt. So in the second noble truth, the Buddha points out the origin of dukkha. And the cause, he says, is craving. Pali Tanha. Let me read the Buddha's own words. What now is the noble truth of the origin of dukkha? It is craving, which gives rise to repeated existence, produces rebirth, which is bound up with pleasure and lust, and finds ever fresh delight now here, now there. It is of three kinds, sensual craving, craving for existence, and craving for annihilation. First, we have to deal with the word tanha. The word means literally thirst. We follow the common practice in translating it as craving. Some writers explain tanha as desire. But this translation can be misleading. It might suggest that Buddhism insists on eliminating all desire, which is false. The Buddha recognizes that desire is ambivalent. It can be good desires, the desire to practice the Dhamma, the desire to give, to observe precepts, the desire to help relieve the suffering of others, and so on. There can also be neutral desires, the desire to take a walk, the desire to sleep when tired or to eat when hungry. And there can also be unwholesome desires. It's the latter desires, the unwholesome ones, that are meant by craving or tanha. That is, desire grounded in ignorance, in delusion, in the drive for personal gratification. The desire seeking pleasure, power, high status for oneself. And though craving is singled out as the cause of dukkha, it shouldn't be thought of as the only factor involved in the origination of suffering. Tanha is selected because it is the chief factor, the principal and the most pervasive factor. Craving is the active, accumulator, the active accumulator of dukkha, the factor which can be seen most clearly in the workings of our minds and the factor which has to be brought under control in treading the path. But craving always works in a whole complex of factors. It's conditioned by ignorance, and by the psychophysical organism. It's directed towards feelings, and it requires objects. It uses the psychophysical organism as its instrument, it issues in clinging and grasping and holding. It builds up formations which perpetuate dukkha. All of this becomes clear in the teaching of dependent arising that we'll explain in lecture number four. The Buddha says that craving takes three forms. There's sensual craving, karma-tanha, craving for existence, bhava-tanha, and craving for annihilation, vipava-tanha. Sensual craving is desire for the five objects of sense pleasure. Craving for pleasant sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch sensations. Also for the enjoyable ideas, images, and so on based on those sense impressions. Then there's craving for existence, bhavatana. This is the desire for continued survival, the life urge the drive to go on existing and to take on special forms, to become prominent, famous, and wealthy, to become this, to become that. 
when joined with the belief in a permanent self, the craving for existence, issues in the desire for personal immortality. Then there's craving for annihilation, for non-existence, the wish for self-annihilation. This arises when the pain of life becomes so unbearable that one wishes to escape by annihilating oneself. Most evident form is suicide, though it can also take on forms of self-destructive behavior. And now we have to see how craving originates dukkha. The causal role of craving can be seen at two levels. We can speak of a psychological level and then a universal or cosmic level. First, at the psychological level, we find that craving is the underlying root of unhappiness. Sorrow, grief, fear, worry, disappointment, all these can be traced to the desire for personal gratification. In the Dhammapada, the Buddha says, from craving there arises sorrow, from craving there arises fear. Craving gives rise to sorrow when we're separated from the persons or things we're attached to, when our hopes are disappointed, when we meet with rejection, feel, fail to get the things we want. Craving also gives rise to fear, we become afraid of losing the things we've obtained, afraid they might be destroyed, afraid the people that we like might reject us, or that circumstances might separate us. There are several stages in the psychological process by which craving leads into dukkha. First of all, at the very moment craving arises, it brings along a certain feeling of dissatisfaction, a tension causing pain and unhappiness. This feeling is born from the contrast between one's present state of lack, oneself without the object, and the possibility of fulfillment, oneself in possession of the object. This is the suffering of lack. Then to get the object, we have to search for it and strive to acquire it. This is the dukkha of striving and seeking. Then once we get the object we want, then we have to protect it, to safeguard it, to make sure it doesn't get stolen, break up, perish. Thus, our enjoyment of the object is accompanied by the suffering of protection. And then, once the object breaks up or the loved one goes away, then there comes the suffering of loss, the suffering of deprivation. At a subtle psychological level, even when we get the objects we desire and can enjoy them freely, then if we examine our minds carefully, we find that simply yielding to desire doesn't bring deep satisfaction. It brings only a temporary gratification, which actually fuels the force of craving, so that craving arises more strongly in the future, with greater force and power than before. We need more pleasure, more money, more power, higher position. It becomes even more demanding, more insatiable. Like a fire, we throw the wood under the fire, the fire subsides a little, then once the wood catches the flame, the fire blazes more intensely, burns stronger than before. In that way, craving brings an even stronger inner dissatisfaction or compelling need to acquire a new object to fill the void. So that's the way craving becomes the origin of suffering at the psychological level. Then, passing to a deeper level, we see a connection between craving and dukkha in that craving is the force which fuels the round of rebirth, samsara. The Buddha describes craving as ponobhavika, leading to repeated existence, to new rebirth. He also says that craving seeks the light now here and now there. As long as the body lives, the mind clings to it. And craving uses the body as its means for finding delight. At death, the body stops functioning so it can no longer support the stream of consciousness. But the craving remains, so when the link between the mind and the body is broken at death, then craving drives the current of consciousness onto a new body. It latches onto a new body as its physical form, brings about rebirth. Conception sets in, the embryo is formed, and the drive for existence continues in a new form 
with a new body as its support, renewing its search for pleasure and enjoyment. Therefore, the Buddha says that craving tanha is the house builder. It builds up the whole house of samsara, all the forms of existence. And as long as the craving is unchecked, the wheel of rebirth continues to turn. It's like a leapfrog arrangement. Craving gives rise to new existence. New existence provides the base for craving. In this way, craving constructs the round of becoming. It issues in rebirth. In that way, it originates the dukkha of the five aggregates, the psychophysical process, again and again. Now, in the third noble truth, the Buddha makes it known that this process of becoming doesn't have to continue indefinitely. He announces the cessation of dukkha. This is the dukkha nirodha arya satcha, the noble truth of the cessation of suffering. And this truth shatters the charge of pessimism and reveals the great affirmation of the Buddha the affirmation that suffering can be totally overcome and that a state of perfect peace is open and available. Now the cessation of dukkha is arrived at simply by following through to its conclusion the logic of causality underlying the second noble truth. If craving is the origin of dukkha, then the key to putting an end to dukkha lies in eliminating craving. And so the cessation of dukkha is the complete cessation and elimination of craving. Now the cessation of suffering that comes with the end of craving, this can be understood at two levels, the psychological and metaphysical level, corresponding to what we said before about craving as the cause of suffering. First, at the psychological level, when craving is cut off, then all mental unhappiness comes to an end. The mind is utterly released from sorrow, worry, fear, grief, and distress. But this is not a mere negative state, but corresponding to the end of dukkha there comes the great peace, Mahashanti, the supreme happiness, complete joy. The liberated one, the Arahant, lives in perfect peace, always content, always serene and happy. He can still experience physical pain that comes through the body. He can still he can still fall sick and he has to grow old and die. But since his mind is released from all clinging, these cause him no disturbance. He goes through them without sorrow. His mind stands unshakable among all the vicissitudes of life. Then, with his death, the whole process of becoming comes to an end. Since he's abandoned craving, there's no seed for new existence. Sangsara, the round of rebirth, draws to a close. This is the state of final deliverance. But this end of dukkha, this is not annihilation, not a plunge into utter non-being, but simultaneously it's a full attainment of the unconditioned Nibbana. The liberated one passes out from the world of becoming to a state which is immeasurable and inconceivable beyond the range of concepts and words. Thus, the third noble truth, the cessation of dukkha, is the reality designated Nibbana. Then, in the fourth noble truth, the Buddha points out the way to bring about the end of dukkha the path to reach Nibbana. That way is the noble eightfold path, which consists of the eight factors, right views, right intentions, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. This is a practical course of treatment which can be applied to our life to overcome the problem of dukkha. So the fourth noble truth is the way to the cessation of suffering, the noble eightfold path. As we go along, we'll deal in much greater detail with the third and fourth noble truth. Here we just deal with them lightly. We'll deal with them more in later lectures. 
Now we conclude by explaining the functions to be performed with regard to each noble truth. For each of the four noble truths presents a challenge. It imposes a particular task which the follower of the Dhamma has to take up and fulfill. The first noble truth, the truth of Dukkha, has to be fully understood. We have to understand the truth of our own existence, of our experience. And so the task imposed by this truth is full understanding, to understand our experience made up of the five aggregates. The second noble truth, tanha or craving, also imposes a task. That is abandonment. We have to abandon craving, the craving which originates suffering. Then the third noble truth, the truth of the cessation of suffering, Nibbana, that is to be realized, to be attained. The task is the realization of Nibbana. And then the fourth noble truth, the truth of the path, that is to be developed, practiced, and cultivated. By developing the path, we come to the full understanding of dukkha. By understanding dukkha, we abandon craving. And by abandoning craving, we realize Nibbana, the end of Dukkha. In this way, the development of the path is the key to fulfilling all four functions regarding the four noble truths.